I'm Brandon Steckler, technical editor of Motor Age Magazine. But I'm not here with you today as technical editor, but an actual automotive technician. See, in my 25 years of experience as an automotive technician in both the independent side of the industry as well as the OEM dealerships, um, I've encountered a lot of pitfalls. I've had a lot of things that have slowed my progress down and, and hindered my advancement as a technician. But on occasion, I catch a, a little golden nugget that really helps me along. So one of the most important things I ever did to help myself be successful in this career as an automotive technician and diagnostician is to learn how to use a lab scope and implement it in my daily routine of analysis and diagnosis. So follow me outside to the vehicle and we'll get started. Before I ever head over to any vehicle for analysis, I always prepare myself for those analyses. And one of the most important things you can do to save yourself time is to actually slow down and not work on the vehicle, but spend your time preparing, preparing a game plan of attack. What I mean by that is researching system description and operation to learn not only how systems and their components are configured to carry out a purpose per vehicle, per that vehicle you're working on, but also to locate a wiring diagram. Those two pieces of information are crucial when approaching a vehicle for analysis. So the vehicle I'm working on, and again, is a 2007 Honda Civic. Of course, I'm using all data, as you can see here, but that's not necessarily important. Um, I find that there are holes in all information sources. Um, when I have an issue with all data, I reach out to one of my other sources of information, like Motologic, Identifix, any of the OEM websites, um, Mitchell On Demand, but in this case, we're just using all data. So my vehicle is an inline four-cylinder engine with a 1.8 liter gasoline internal combustion engine. I'm going to visit the wiring diagram section. OE wiring diagrams is what I prefer to use. And I will visit air conditioning. HVAC. And I will find the wiring diagram for my blower motor, which is right here. So we've got a blower motor relay that is always grounded. And with the ignition switch on, or in this case, hot at all times, voltage is available right here at this relay switch terminal. When that relay is commanded on with the ignition switch, the contacts will close and provide voltage on the white wire, which means the green wire is referenced to ground, and that ground is controlled by a blower motor power transistor. Now, the only reason I'm showing you this is so we can prepare ourselves for analysis. In this case, it's not really that important because this blower motor supplied voltage and a ground source and we're simply going to implement an amp probe and place it anywhere in this circuit. Anywhere in this circuit here will show us the current flow through that blower motor. So now it's time to head over to the vehicle. Well we are here at the vehicle. The subject vehicle is a 2007 Honda Civic. Not that that matters. We're going to be implementing both the lab scope with the amp probe as an accessory and what we're going to do is capture amperage or current flow through the blower motor. Now this blower motor does have a dead spot in it. It's quite old. It's got over 270,000 miles on this vehicle. So the blower motor is worn out and we're going to capture that data on the lab scope screen. I'm underneath the dashboard on the passenger side of the vehicle and of course here is our blower motor and our blower motor connector with both the power and ground supply. I'm going to take my amp probe and interface it to one of those wires like so I will switch my amp probe on zero it out and I will return to my lab scope to operate it so now we're gonna operate the blower motor and capture the data on the lab scope
Okay, so we've got our capture stored in our scopes buffer, and we are away from the vehicle, relaxing with our thoughts and preparing to analyze. So we have the scope capture on the screen showing the inrush current implementing our cursors we see about 10 and a half amps. I can also see my motor's average running current at just over 3 amps, maybe maybe 3 and a half amps. And that's all great information. Unfortunately at this zoomed out repetitive view there is no detail that we can see inside this capture to alert us to the health of that motor. For that we'd have to zoom in. And that's not a big deal on this scope, this PC-based Pico Lab scope. However, other scopes don't possess that ability. For instance, snap-on scope platforms don't allow you to zoom in. They only allow you to zoom out. So with this vehicle and the strategy to capture this data to infer the health of this motor, I would not have a time base of 50 seconds across the screen. I'd have something like 20 milliseconds across the screen. I'd capture the data and then I would zoom out on a snap-on scope to see this information. So back to this Pico scope to see the health of the motor we can't view it from this repetitive view, this trend view zoomed way up. Again this is the equivalent of the Hawk being way up in the cloud surveying the land for his next meal. He's certainly not going to execute an attack from that altitude. He's going to get closer and closer until he can find the right time and moment uh, for his final approach for that attack. That's what we are going to do. So we're going to go in here and grab a zoom window. And I'm not concerned with this inrush current. I'm concerned right over here with this average running current. But I will tell you this inrush current does offer a clue. Um, it's typical for a DC motor that's in a healthy circuit to have an inrush current that's approximately three times the amplitude as the average running current. So this is about two and a half, three amps. This would be about nine amps or more, and that's what we're seeing here. It infers good health of that circuit. Um, if, for instance, I had uh, damage to a relay contact or a spread terminal creating a voltage drop, I might have a beautiful waveform. However, this inrush current would be a lot lower, significantly lower. So that ratio of 3 to 1 wouldn't be there. That's just a little tip. But that's not what we're here for today. So we're going to look at the health of the motor. And I'm just going to come in here and grab some information. And what we can see here is what we refer to in the industry as a signature hump. Each one of these up and downs represents when a commutator bar comes in contact with the brushes and then current peaks. And then as that commutator begins to rotate and the segments between the two commutator bars come in contact with the brushes, current then decreases. So this represents a signature hump and that's a signature hump, that's a signature hump. Each one of these represents one full rotation or cycle of that motor. And I'm not going to count them, but there's probably, let's see, 5, 10, 15, 25 or 30 cycles over this looks to be about 1.1 seconds of elapsed time. So again, it gives us a bit more detail than our zoom, zoomed out view, um, but certainly not enough detail to make a diagnostic decision. So I'm going to zoom in even tighter. I like to capture at least two full cycles on the screen, like so. And this allows me to make a better diagnosis. So what we have here is one commutator bar hump, current hump one, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and then one again. Uh, this motor is significantly worn out. We should anticipate these humps being similar to one another. Now, I don't mean exactly the same, and there's no need to pick the, the waveform apart to be too critical. And as you begin to practice, this becomes more evident for you. But what concerns me are these dropouts here. Um, they're significantly lower than the other ones. So. This is a 12 segment commutator bar armature in this blower motor and one of them um, has significantly less current than the rest. This is a dropout. So with that being said, we found the reason why the blower motor intermittently stops working. And if you could look at this as the commutator bars as, as a pizza pie that's been segmented instead of eight slices, maybe 12 slices, or look of it like uh, the wheel in the wheel of fortune. We can refer to this as the wheel of misfortune because 
if the brushes of that motor fall on this burnt commutator bar, current can't flow and we can't produce the magnetic field that causes that armature to rotate. So this is why we drive the vehicle and occasionally we hit a bump and that bump causes the motor to rotate ever so slightly. Current flow is reestablished, magnetism is reestablished, and then the blower motor seems to operate just fine. And it will continue to do so as long as that motor does not come to rest on the burnt commutator bar contact area. So to sum it up, this is our zoom overview, right? The zoomed out repetitive capture that does not show much detail. We are zoomed into within two full cycles to see the repetitive nature of the fault. So we've got the best of both worlds. We see repeating pattern. However, we also see the fault. But my point is, if we zoom in too far, we're going to miss the fault. So I'm going to zoom in right here. And we're far too close. If we're far too close, we're not going to see what it is we need to see. So choosing the right time base is crucial portion to your setup, just like choosing the right voltage range. Or in another video, we are going to choose trigger level. We'll talk about that in another time. But again, the point is we have to choose the right time base to be able to capture the data efficiently. Capturing the correct data is one portion of the puzzle. But capturing the data from the correct perspective is what you need to see what you need to see, which will allow you to make a diagnosis. So some of you previous to this video may not have been aware of the difference between a zoomed in detailed view and one that is zoomed out to capture more of a repetitive nature of a pattern. But I hope you do now, and I hope you realize the power in, in implementing both of these in your diagnostic routine. Learning to implement the lab scope properly is going to drastically enhance your ability to diagnose not only accurately, but more, efficient, more efficiently as well. And when you have accuracy and efficiency, your confidence goes through the roof. Take my word. So I want to thank you again for joining me, and please join me next time uh, in our next video in the series. Again, I'm Brandon Steckler with MotorAge Magazine. Take care.